Thank you. It's good to see so many well-scrubbed faces again. And thanks for attending. The, so this came about because nine months ago, the faculty got together and said, we need to do more in cybersecurity. And the question is, do we want to build a special course on it? Or do we want to integrate it into the existing courses? And the uh, faculty decided they wanted to integrate um, into existing courses. So this is sort of a, a new initiative with us that we're in the process. This is not a fait accompli, but we're in the process of integrating at least one topic from cyber into each of our courses. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a, pick out a couple people from the audience and have them come up and build some fault trees. <laughs> No, that was a joke. And uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up, break this into kind of three parts. A situation awareness, kind of what I see as the situation currently, and then comments from the faculty and their deliberations that they've told me what they think is meaningful for them in their courses. So it'll be sort of... Uh, featuring some of your favorite instructors. And then toward the end, get into more what I see as possible trends and challenges. So, so this is cyberspace, the next frontier. Now, how many people know where the word cyberspace came from? So while you were reading Shakespeare, some of us were reading cyberpunk back in the 80s. And one of the novels by William Gibson, Burning Chrome, in 1982, a neuromancer, was the first to use the term cyberspace. So this author created that term, cyberspace. If you go to uh, you know, Google a definition of cyberspace today, it's much broader. But uh, what um, Gibson was talking about was pretty close to what you would think of as second life. Or if you go to the movies, to The Matrix. The Matrix is sort of a, um, a rehash, in some sense, of uh, William Gibson's books. Uh, but today, the, the phrase cyberspace refers to a lot broader. It, it, it almost encompasses all the, the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm not quite that ambitious. I'm going to focus mostly on digital, particularly the internet. Uh, but keep in mind that it does have a a broader connotation. Now, I happened to be at a software conference in New Orleans in 1984 where I met Timothy Leary, and Timothy said, software is the new drug. And you know, I kind of chuckled at the time, but in some sense it's true. It's come true. If you think about it, there's roughly a half a billion people. If they're not addicted to Facebook, they're certainly would have some sort of withdrawal symptoms if we took Facebook or Twitter away from them. Okay, so, in, so again, this may have been a present uh, comment uh, made by Timothy Leary in, what is that, almost 30 years ago. In fact, the uh, internet and what we know uh, today about cyberspace didn't really exist in 1984, did it? Didn't become com commercialized until 1998 and most of us hadn't heard about the so-called internet until roughly 95, 96 time frame. So again, this was sort of a present uh, comment. And I think this today, as, you, as I'll try to make a point, uh, is still kind of a lingering philosophy and uh, trend within the so-called internet age or the internet group of people. So exactly what is it? Well, we think it's a big machine. We think that, uh, you know, technical definition, that cyberspace is made up of anything that speaks the TCP IP protocol, the internet protocol. But it's more than that, right? Because it's made up of a lot of people, a lot of websites, etc. Uh, this is just some recent statistics. There's two billion users as of 2011. These, these numbers keep changing, so 
their, their time stamp because they're probably bigger than that, that now. 250 million websites, 150 million blogs, three and a half billion registered devices. Think of that, three and a half billion registered devices. That's, that's roughly 50% of the planet's population currently has some kind of device to access the internet. You know, in some parts of the world, there's no difference between a smart cell phone and the internet, because a lot of people don't have a laptop or a, uh, a computer to, to make access. They're actually doing this through a smartphone. So that's where you get the large numbers. Does anybody know what the market is for cell phones currently? It's over a billion a year. So think of that as a market opportunity for companies that are building smartphones. One billion are in Asia. Only 250 are in North America. This is something I want you to think about. The internet and cyberspace predominantly lies outside the United States. It's a much bigger deal outside the United States than it is within the United States. In fact, there's a United Nations of cyberspace that has been brought forward by uh, various people in the UN to define what cyberspace is, you know, to geomap it, if you will, onto the, the globe. And they've done so, and there's five regions. And these five regions are essentially what they've done is they've parceled out the real estate of the internet by saying, Africa, you get this block of IP addresses, and North America, you get this block, and so on. They parceled these out uh, so that when uh, you go to register your, your domain name with a, a provider, you're getting one of those do, uh, names and numbers from that parcel has been already subdivided. Uh, some people within the United Nations have proposed the access to the internet as a human right, not as a privilege or, or something optional, but that everyone on the planet has a human right to have access to cyberspace via this. So that is happening sort of at the international level. Another interesting thing about the uh, situation is that the users have been concentrating for the last 10 years. If you think of the Internet is being big, and it is big because of all these users, but what do, what do they actually use? They actually use a very small portion of what's available. So if you look at this, there's a recent 2011 count of the audience to the top websites, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, Facebook, AOL, etc. cetera. Um, actually, most users use very small percentage of the internet. They're highly concentrated in these top sites. So Google and YouTube have about 48% of the web traffic. Almost half of web traffic goes to Google and YouTube. Facebook, in terms of page views, has 40% of that web traffic. iTunes from Apple has 250 million credit cards registered. The demographics of this are constantly changing, but roughly one-third of the world's population is online. 45% are under 25 years old. Think of that. Almost half are, were uh, born uh, uh, within, what, since 1980? Isn't that interesting? So to me, 1980 was just yesterday, right? But, but uh, think of that. Uh, most of the users, or half of the users here, are, haven't, uh, aren't much older than the Internet itself. 62% are from developing nations, not Western. Over half are not, you know, it gets into all kind of social political issues about your belief systems and your, your uh, cultural biases, etc. And 62% are not what we'd consider Westerners. 23% are from China, only 12% are from the U.S. So the United States is a minor player. The United States invented the Internet in 1969, 
The Department of Defense invested $200 million before it was commercialized, and we're a minor player. Think about that. Well, the average user of Facebook has 130 friends. Um, Australians are the most active Facebook users. If you look at globally, there's 700 billion minutes per month spent on Facebook. Think of the productivity, I don't know, gain or loss. 700 billion minutes. The average is 15 and a half hours per month. The average uh, viewer of television is 80 hours per month per person. So it's still not as pervasive as television, but it's getting there. Over 50% play games. This is on Facebook. There's no wonder that uh, Farmville and Zynga is a big deal on the stock market. Because 50% of the Facebook users are there to play games. That's a big market. Over 1 trillion pages are indexed as of 2008 by Google. And roughly five and a half, well, almost six hours per month, month on the average use of viewing YouTube. Think if you were Comcast or you are a network broadcaster like NBC or CBS or Fox News or CNN. This is your competition. This is the changing world. You, you are, even today, you're not experiencing demographics like that. So we, we should expect huge changes in what we consider as the media business, whether it's television or the movie business, because of this. This is going to be a major shift. So the um, graphics here show what you're in the middle of cyberspace, which is very big and global. And, and there's even people working on making it an intergalactic network, because on some of the probes that have gone to Mars and outer uh, part of the solar system are now using TCP IP. And so you can think of the internet as being an intergalactic network. Or you can think of this lower graphic of you're part of a community. And there are not very many communities out there that uh, have captured the eyeballs of most of us. So in some sense, the, the internet is the biggest machine we've ever made. In another sense, it's the smallest machine that we've ever made because of this concentration of how it's used. So it's big, but it's not that big. If you were to equate this with human capability, that the internet now contains about the equivalent information stored in 20 million people's brains. So the internet, in a way, it has the recall ability of 20 million people. Certainly not 7 billion people. OK? So it's got a long ways to go yet to be sort of the, the uber brain of the human uh, experience. So people are projecting that it'll be equal to the entire human race in terms of storage in 10 years, in another decade. Doubling rough, they, people think it's doubling roughly in uh, content about every year or 15 months. This is the other interesting thing. Half of the online data is unprotected. So this is interesting from uh, our perspective here today, because half of the data, nobody is even attempting to protect it. Think about that. <clears throat> you hear every day now on the news about people losing their identity or the system being hacked, this, that, and the other thing. Well, one of the reasons is because there's basically not very much effort being put into securing the information, to protecting it. We're not even trying. So that's kind of interesting. Also, there's all this talk about, uh, well, won't the power grid crash and won't banking crash and all this stuff because of cyberspace? Well, they're not on the internet. The Fedwire and so forth, these are non-internet systems. They were actually put in place before the internet came along. But what the threat is, what the problem is, this is rapidly changing. Because TCP IP and the internet is cheap. 
It's easy. It's open. So if you're in business, you're saying, well, how can I cut costs? How can I reach lots of people? That kind of thing. And so this is gradually changing. We're, so we're creating the next generation of problems because we're sort of volunteering to put our information assets onto networks where half of the data is not even, we don't even take the time to secure it. So, and Dr. Galloway's talk was pretty interesting because he's saying, well, you know, why don't we things? Why don't we, I mean, it's the same thing here with the internet, is we're doing it to ourselves in many, many respects. It doesn't include things like GPS, satellite communications, and transportation systems, et cetera, but that is changing, and not necessarily for the better. So some of you remember this from class, and some of you are shopping on Zappo instead of listening to my lecture in class. <laughs> but the first hack was done by Robert Tappan Morris and he was a college student, and he really wasn't being the malicious. He was trying to figure out the size of the internet. And back in the 80s when he did this, the internet was 6,000 computers. So he was just trying to map out how many people were actually on the internet. And the so-called Morris worm got loose. There's, uh, there may be like the Ninja Turtles we saw this morning, or the, the worm that ate the internet got loose, and he was um, punished, got a three-year suspended sentence. One of the first uses of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986, a $10,000 fine and 40 hours of community service. Well, where is Robert Trapp and Morris today? He's a professor at MIT, and he sold his company to Yahoo for $40, $48 million. So he's a rich professor. <laughs> now you have no idea how this irritates me. Okay? But Robert Tappan Moore's exploit was simple. Those days are long gone. They're no longer simple. I'm going to argue that worms and malicious software like this have rapidly mutated like a virus, like a biological model into things like Stuxnet, Stuxnet, and this is the challenge, is they're becoming more complex faster than we're unraveling them and discovering what to do about them. Well, here's another story, a more recent, more contemporary, for those of you in the audience that are young at heart, you want to know something that happened since 1986, because that's prehistory, right? This is the king of spam. Oleg, a 24-year-old Russian, um, he was making about $325,000, I guess, uh, a year, uh, basically spamming people. He was what's known as a bot herder. Uh, uh, essentially, if you got spam, you probably came from this guy. At one time, this guy was responsible for 90% of email traffic on the Internet. And how did he do that? Well, you know about zombies. He recruited your computers to spread the spam. So his botnet at one time was estimated to have three million unwilling users, un unbeknownst to the users, where their computers were being used to spread sp uh, spam around. In fact, here's a chart that shows this sort of peaked around 2010. And then after they put a stop to the Russian business network and to Oleg's operation, the traffic on the uh, email traffic on the internet dropped 82%. So you can see that these things are, you can see that the internet is sort of a rich environment for crime. You know, all kinds of analogs have been made. It's like uh, leaving your house with the door open or or not having any police patrols at all. Or, you know, it's, it's easy pickings for uh, these bad people. Well, we got rid of that one. And by the way, uh, Russian Business Network operated out of St. Petersburg, Russia, and we have no jurisdiction there. 
And it was only when the Russian uh, officials decided to shut it down, it got shut down through a kind of protests on uh, everybody else's part because the Russians said, there's nothing wrong with this. There's no reason to have, you know, to stop free enterprise. Okay, so but that was shut down. But there's plenty to replace them. There's a, a list here of other botnets. Now, so what are our botnets? Botnets are sort of a network embedded in the internet. And it's embedded through putting malicious software, unbeknownst to you, onto your computers, onto your servers, and onto your laptops, etc. So it's a clandestine network operating on top of or within the official network. And no one knows what this means. We have this case with the spammers, but no one knows. Does that mean, for example, someday we might wake up and the internet will now have been taken over by these botnet networks? Does it mean that someone was going to crash the internet because they're going to cause these botnets to eat everybody's data? We don't really know. In China, where we think malware comes from, is not the big player. 25% of malware comes from this country. 15% from Russia and a little bit less from China. So you hear about the big Chinese scare, right? The Chinese are stealing our IP and so on and so forth. Well, they, they are, but that's nothing compared to what we're doing within the country. We're, we have twice the activity within the U.S. as we do from China. So one of the trends then from kind of looking at this is the rising sophistication, the, what I call the recombinant DNA movement within the bad guy's world. If you compared Stuxnet with uh, Morse's worm, it's a thousand times more complex. But what's also interesting about Stuxnet is it was nothing new other than the combination of something old. Stuxnet appears to be using existing exploits, packaging them in a different way, different combinations, and actually using many of them, and then releasing it against a given target, a specific target, in this case, the centrifuge machines in Iran. But what's interesting to us technologists about Stuxnet is a new recombination of the old. For example, when you create a download of video, Internet Explorer, you're opening yourselves to an exploit. And that was one way in which Stuxnet, as one mechanism that Stuxnet made to get around on, on PCs. It used other mechanisms as well, but that was a well-known, I mean, that was known as a vulnerability in Internet Explorer five years ago. There's been worse attacks than Stuxnet. Mariposa infected machines in 190 countries. All kinds of government and banks, et cetera, were infected by that. So one of our faculty members, Rodrigo Nero Gomez, says, he's written a paper about that, he says, innovators are on the wrong side. The innovation is taking place on the bad guy. We're not innovating because we're being in a reactive mode, but the clever stuff, if you tear apart these malware and so forth, the clever stuff is being done by the bad guys. And um, FBI set, claims that the fraud uh, loss is about a half a billion dollars uh, currently. Okay. Now, is that a big number or a small number? Turns out that is a pretty small number. If you stack this up against other things, internet fraud, which is not the only thing that's happening, right, but just the, the kind of the financial sides. Internet fraud is about a half a billion. Grand theft auto is 10 times that. Retail shoplifting is 20 times that. Credit card identity theft is 13 and a half billion, about the same size. Car accidents are about $230 billion a year. And then the median household loss due to the 2008 meltdown was six trillion in lost wealth. So we have to put this in perspective, right? So on one hand, it's not a big 
consequence right now. On the other hand, people are worried about the so-called uh, cyber Pearl Harbor that may be lurking there in the background that's going to happen to us going forward. And I think that's a valid concern. But if you look at, if you look at risk today, the cybersecurity risk is one of the smallest that we have to face. The question is, is that it is getting bigger faster, okay? And will that actually end up being a major issue going forward? So again, in relative to the talk we heard this morning, we have to have that, that fan-shaped uh, uncertainty cone going, looking forward and not a, a narrow tube view of, of these things. Well, in terms of deaths, we don't think there's been any internet deaths or deaths caused by the internet. There might be one case in uh, Australia. Uh, but house fires, 3,000 per year. But look at this, medical errors. 225,000 deaths per year due to medical errors, of which 44,000 were in hospitals. So again, we have to put this in perspective to uh, what actually the risk is. So that's the black swan event. For those of you that are recent graduates, we talk a lot about the black swan now. The black swan is that highly unlikely but highly consequential sort of outlier that we don't expect. And we don't expect it, but if we believe the black swan theory, we should expect it. Because it's not zero probability, it's just a low probability. And when you, when you multiply that small probability times a big number of consequence, you still get something of significance, and maybe that's what we should worry about. And that's kind of where we are with respect to internet threats. This is a chart that comes from the uh, Department of Commerce that says, well, how big would a one-day outage of the Internet be compared to other catastrophes? And you see earthquakes are on the extreme left here. Hurricanes are next. And we're, a, a, a one-day Internet blackout would equate roughly with the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. Okay, so again, it's not a big thing yet. And compare that with the 2008 financial meltdown, which damaged 20% of the GDP. It goes off the chart. Okay, so I just want you to get a perspective of the numbers here. So what does it mean to have a secure cyberspace? Well, what's interesting is the definition of security in cyberspace was done 10 years ago. In 1999, there was a a standard called the PKI standard adopted by internet for how to make the internet secure. And how many of us use it? How many of our IT departments implement it? So to some extent, if we wanted to cut the threat down dramatically, we would just do what we already know how to do which is to implement some of the security standards. Furthermore, when people say, well, we don't, you know, we're running around, we don't know how to secure the internet. Well, we actually do. We have four rules. We have four rules that if we follow, it's claimed, at least on a theoretical basis, that you can secure the internet or cyberspace. It's authentication. That's make sure you, you know who's signed on. Integrity, that is, guarantee that people haven't messed with your documents. Confidentiality, that is you can encrypt the documents and hide the information. And non-repudiation, now non-repudiation is a good one because it means that if you use PKI, you can always tell where the message came from, where the threat came from, okay? You can't deny it, it's actually admissible in court if you uh, use digital signatures and this PKI mechanism. Well, guess what? The bad guys are ahead of us on this front because they already went after the primary vendor of PKI, RSA Corporation, which is, supplies security to big corporations and I guess to uh, anyone who wants it. And they, they, so the hackers decided, let's attack the very heart of the secure internet, let's attack the certificate system that 
as part of the, the standard, and they've had some modest successes at doing that. There's no governance of the internet. In some cases, the internet governance has superseded the official government. I mean, there's probably a har hardly a politician in the United States today that's not concerned about Occupy Wall Street voters and Tea Party voters and activists on, online in the internet. In fact, you could argue that it might not even be possible to be elected president anymore without quote, satisfying the internet bloggers and uh, people who are members of Facebook and so forth. So Kelly Lassen was the instigator of Occupy Wall Street. I don't know if you know much about him, but he's, you, you might consider him a, um, in the same class with some of these other people I've shown up here because he's, he's a proclaimed anti-capitalist, anti-commercialist, uh, anti-government, anarchist, and he also runs a magazine that has 70 to 90,000 subscribers, which is about the right size to start a movement. And so he used the technology to start a movement, and he was successful. Now, he was successful at starting the movement. Where the movement went, or where it is now, probably baffles him. He doesn't necessarily control it, but he instigated it. So here you have not necessarily a friend to government or to our society who's able to control things using this new tool called the internet. If you look at the, the likes, you know, on Facebook you have likes and dislikes. It grew to approximately three million in six weeks because of one person, Kelly Lassen, one person starting a conflagration on the internet. So on the inter internet, nobody knows you're a dog. That's not exactly what John Rawlings says, but he said, who is attacking the system and for what purpose is unknown to us. Okay, and what uh, Stan Sapinski says is, who do you call? It is difficult to differentiate between an attack and a simple malfunction. Yeah, we saw that, didn't we? We had the so-called attack on the water system in Illinois that turned out to be a malfunction. Right? What are the responsibilities of the business owners and the public law enforcement community? If one of our privately owned water works is attacked, do they go to the local police or to the FBI? So this is sort of an unresolved issue currently. And Bob Simmerall, who teaches our Intel course, uh, says a role of intelligence is to identify, collect, and track an attack, notice the word attack, a threat target. This is well understood in the physical world, not so well understood in the cyber world. And Eric Dahl, his colleague, says the problem isn't just a new set of non-state actors, but it's a new world where the intelligence and national security communities haven't yet got the faintest idea of what they are doing. That's pretty harsh words, but maybe it's, it's true. Now, if you had PKI, if it's like required, which is a heavy word too, then you would have non-repudiation, and so you would know. But without that, as you, as you well know now because you sat through our court, the internet has a clear source and destination addresses done. The, the source and the destination addresses are in the clear, so anybody can change them, and that's what hackers do. They'll change where the message came from to make it look like it came from the office of the White House or somewhere else, and you can't trace it back. But with PKI, you can, because it has non-repudiation ability. <clears throat> so there are some things that have been done. The e-commerce, or the e-government act of 2002, uh, defines Einstein 1, 2, and 3. How many people have heard of Einstein 1, 2, and 3? Okay, a few people have. What are we implementing? By 2008, only 15 of 600 agencies have adopted any aspect of Einstein, even the mild form. The mild form of Einstein or Einstein 1 is just to, just to watch what's going on and report it. Level two is defend against it. Level three is to go on the offense. Now we know some black organizations are taking the offense. 
that's happening. But, you know, by 2008, I don't know what it is today, but of only 15 of 600 agencies adopting this, it's not a very good record. So again, let me tell you that we have, we have standards, we have mechanisms, we have technology, we just don't have the will to do it, to actually increase security. So Richard Bergen says, to understand cybersecurity, we must understand its ecosystem. Okay, so, you, so here's what's going on. You got this big fat prey out there, and you got this much less, but still significant, maybe a couple hundred thousand people that are prey on that big fat prey because the internet is just big juicy target with this, for the most part, not protected, not secured, and you can make lots of money off of it. You can be like Oleg and you can make $365,000 a year uh, herding a bot herd around and spamming people. So, so we sh maybe should start looking at this like a complex system. And there's a recent study that was pretty interesting about the University of California at San Diego did where they actually um, became bad guys. They became black hats. And it was an amusing story because the researchers said, try going to the, the president of your university and telling them you want money to be a bad guy to go onto the black market and find out how these things actually work. So they did this, okay, in a um, pretty heavily funded program involved lots of people. They became part of the black network. They became part of the, the underworld. And they discovered some interesting things. One of the most interesting things was that if you get spammed or if a, a virus hits you or if you get uh, PIIs, stolen from or whatever, there's actually a whole big network behind this. And then there, they looked at one network, for example, that, that did their banking in Kazakhstan and did their operations out of Russia and did their attacks in Brazil and they were located in the United States. Okay, and they used the all network stuff to do this. But what was interesting is they found the key to stopping it. And the key was Visa and MasterCard. So the banking sector was the hub in this network. So they said, well, what do we do about that? We know how to stop this, but we have to have the Visas and the MasterCards cooperate with us. So they called up the Visa and Microsoft, uh, uh, MasterCard people and they said, well, you know, we know this stuff, but we're not quite sure you would like us to work with you because, you know, you'll say we're interfering, right? And to the contrary, Visa and MasterCard said, no, we love it, come on down. And they stopped, like in one fell swoop, they stopped 40% of the crime that was going on over the previous year, simply by telling the banking system what the IP addresses were and what to look for in the bad guys. So there's an example of a kind of a private-public partnership that worked out pretty well. What was interesting about this is that wasn't the target, their security, it was the banking system. It was the, that was the, the handle that allowed them to stop the problems. So, so that might be one place to start, okay? And now we know that there are these gigantic, juicy hubs called Facebook and Twitter and iTunes, etc. that you can just dealing with those, you're going to hit at least half of the, the population and maybe two-thirds of the population. And, you're going to, and correspondingly, you're going to address half or two-thirds of the problem, just from a very small handful of these uh, websites. So let's, let me kind of back off for a second. Let's look at what some of the megatrends are. One of them is entanglement. Everything is connected to everything else. For an example of that is the SQL Slammer in 2002. The ATM network for Bank of America is not on the internet. It's a separate network. But some person in the bank hooked that computer that controls the ATM network up to the internet, and it became infected by the internet. So there's an entanglement. All I had to do is 
make that network isolated from the internet, and everything works fine. But once they connected it up to the internet, for various reasons, then they got themselves into trouble. It not only stopped the ATM network for a weekend, but it also stopped the uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, didn't affect the power plant, but they were worried that it might have, so they shut it down to, for, I think, for four hours. Another megatrend, concentration of assets. This is known in biology as Gauss's law. But think about this for a second. The internet cognosi, the people who uh, built it, basically, going all the way back to the 70s and 80s, they wanted an open system. They didn't want security. They wanted it to be open. And they wanted it to be open so anybody could use it. But guess what's happening? It's the internet's being bought up, folks. There's monopolistic ownership going on in terms of bandwidth and in terms of, in the telecom industry, it was known as peering. The biggest peer, that is the number of connections over here, Cogent PSI, has 2,972 connections that makes them the most connected, okay? That's a private company. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the chances of bad software, malicious software, worms and viruses, going through that particular business are very high because it's connected to everything. So if you want to stop malicious software, you should go talk to these guys because the chances are 80% of traffic goes through them. The other thing I'll point out is that, look on the left side. Bandwidth is being monopolized. There, I, my site isn't very good, but I don't see a single U.S. corporation or U.S. entity on the bandwidth side that owns bandwidth. Most of it's in Europe or someplace else. Again, if you want to stop malicious software from traveling the internet, those are the people you go to. You only need to go to like 10, 10 companies to stop most of it, because guess what? The internet's being bought up, folks. It's not an open, free, uh, you know, free for all. It's actually a business. And people are saying, you know, and some of them, they're, some of the names in here are the old traditional monopolistic names, AT&T, right? Okay. So it's being bought up. And it's not being bought up by the US. It's being bought up by non-US companies. So for example, Vodafone is probably, at some point in the future, will own big chunks of the internet. OK, another one is enrichment and coevolution. The idea is that you have more computers, which means you have more people on the internet, and more cell phones, which means you beget more internet and more exploitation, et cetera. It goes on and on. So hacking is a coevolution phenomenon. It co-evolves with connectivity. You hook, up, you hook up something new, like a bank, or you hook up something like a transportation system, it attracts a whole new group of hackers that have figured out clever ways of exploiting the, that new connection. And this, in, again, in biology, is known as Weig's paradox of enrichment at work. The internet is one gigantic example of the paradox of enrichment. And that's your homework, to go read, to Google that and find out what that means. Okay? Convergence. Everything's going to TCP IP. Why? Not because it's secure, but because it's cheap and easy. So while we may not run our financial systems on the internet today, in the future we probably will because it's attractive as a way to do business. And this, I think, should be viewed as a threat by this group because that's going to make our job much more difficult. And this is from a student, 1101, 1102. She says, for me, it is that evolution between SCADA and the internet an increasing desire for accessibility of use, that is most troublesome. So this is, comes down to you know, what, you, what your job is on a day-to-day -day basis of dealing with this kind of thing. There's a, another kind of corollary to this, this the so-called monoculture risk. What's a monoculture? Well, it's when everybody is the same, right? It's when everybody uses the same computer, 
same operating system, same servers, same everything. You reduce your, your um, immunity to the risk. So it's interesting that businesses want everything to be the same because it's easy to maintain. They want everybody to have the same computer, same software, same version of everything. But this is enrichment. This is a juicy target for people that are looking to exploit Windows or exploit whatever it is. And you only need to put a small percentage of non-XYZ brand into a network and it has a huge impact on, on cutting back on the monoculture, reducing the mono, monoculture. Our asymmetry is increasing. A 2001 cell has the size of a 1941 empire. This is from Rodrigo Nieto Gomez, who, if you want to find out more, go read his paper in HSAJ, this last issue, The Power of the Few. So yeah, this is an interesting thing because it's, it's kind of like saying, what if, er, what if anybody who wanted one could own an atomic bomb? You see, we've always depended upon a big ocean or the high cost of developing a weapon to prevent the NGOs or the bad guys from defeating us. But that's all changed now. That's gone. And the internet, you don't have to have very many resources. You have to be smart, but you don't have to have very many resources to cause a lot of damage, to potentially cause a lot of damage. So that balance of power now has shifted to the individual. Now that's a scary thing. And so disruption risk continues to grow in a lot of, along these uh, different dimensions that I've uh, already talked about. Then there's the final one. This is maybe even the most difficult. Where's the internet law? Now there's a guy named uh, Larry Lessig that you should probably read about. He wrote a book called Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. He's probably the deepest thinker in this. And he sort of outlines two directions. You can, direction one is you can take what we already have as law in the physical world, just transplant it to the cyber world. Or you can take the other approach and say, well, there's something different about cyber that means that we have to come up with all new laws. I mean, you see this all the time, right? The fight over copyright. What does it mean to have a copyright? Well, in the old world, Copyright protected the expression of an idea. It didn't protect the idea. So if you, it didn't protect music. It protected the fact that you wrote music down on a sheet of paper. That's what you're, the sheet of paper with the notes on it is what you copyrighted. Well, what does that mean in a digital world where copying stuff is just clicking a mouse or just taking a photograph of something or lots of different ways of doing it, right? Does that necessitate a new law? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm not going to get into this very much as a whole subject on its own, but it's interesting. And then, what do the freedoms mean online? The internet treats censorship as a malfunction and routes around it, according to John A. Barlow, retired Wyoming cattle rancher. Who the heck's that? But it, the former lyricist for the Grateful Dead and co-founder of the Electronic Found Frontier Foundation, and John Perry Barlow is sort of the social equivalent of one of the founders of the internet. Because the Electronic Frontier Foundation, kind of like the ACLO, ACLU, only for the internet, has been around since the beginning. So what does it mean to have freedoms? Does it mean that you can bully someone until they commit suicide on the internet? Is that freedom of speech? Or does it mean that you have to be careful what you say on the internet because you could be sued for it. Is that freedom of speech? Here's a statistic. 57% of students said that someone had said hateful or angry things to them online. What does that mean for freedom of speech? Okay, I don't have answers. I just have questions. So here's a bunch of them. This is a starter list. Is it even possible to secure and if we know about these exploits, can they be deterred even? Are they acts of war? When the Russians, quote, invaded Georgia by uh, denial of service on their government and their, their banking system, was that an act of war? 
if Iran hacks into the banking system of the United States, is that an act of war? If the United States launches Stuxnet to take out the centrifuges in Iran, is that an act of war? We don't know, do we? We, don't, we haven't thought that through, what, what that means. Do human rights translate to cyberspace? Freedom of speech, assembly, due process. Might there, I mean, in places like China, you're almost forbidden from assembling on Google or uh, Google Plus or Facebook because the government is worried that it may cause an Arab Spring to spring out, right? So is that going to happen in this country? Is that the type of things that we care about? And then finally, the question about do existing laws translate to cyberspace at all? Do we have to relook at those issues? So that's my story. That's what we're thinking as a faculty. This is sort of where we are. And welcome comments. Thank you.